pass the floor to Volodya. Volodya and Grisha have 20 minutes. That part is the strict part. And we will follow with 30 minutes of questions and comments from everyone. And that's the relaxed part. So Volodya, you have, uh, I believe you are muted. Or no, you are not muted, but I cannot hear you. Ah, good. Do you hear me? Yes. And yes. I can hear and I can see your slides. So I will start counting 20 minutes now. OK. Uh, thanks for this. Uh, hello, everybody. And thanks for this opportunity uh, uh, for, to lead this discussion. Uh, I should warn from the very beginning that uh, it will be mostly the interviewability uh, in planner N equals four super young mills. And uh, let me first uh, declare that N equals four super young mills and ABJM model are integrable in the planner limit, as we now know. And the global questions which we want to pose in our presentations with Grisha uh, Korczewski um, is, first of all, what does it mean, integrability, integrability in this case? Uh, what are the origins of this integrability? What is achieved due to the, to the integrability? Uh, and uh, what else might be achieved? Okay, uh, then uh, uh, one must say that the, the origins of this integrability are still quite mysterious because uh, our final results, our uh, most advanced results are based usually on uh, bootstrap, as matrix bootstrap approach, which is uh, far from being proven for uh, more or less complicated sigma models, maybe only for the simplest ones like side Gorton. So from the very beginning, uh, we have to ask the, the same question here in um, uh, in the sigma in the string sigma model uh, in the dual string sigma model, but we have some exact observations. Uh, uh, first of all, we have explicit integrability in the lowest orders of perturbation theory in n equals four young mills. Then we have also perfectly visible classical integrability on the wall sheet of sigma model, and even uh, and uh, the rest of it uh, are some mysterious uh, constellations in, in planar perturbation theory or uh, on the string wall sheet. Uh, for example, the highest transcendentality graphs survive uh, for physical quantities um, uh, by, the, by the reasons which are not understood. And many of you working not necessarily on integrability in n equals four young mills observe a lot of mysterious facts uh, that why so many calculations are possible in this theory. In, and, but there is a, a, a little glimpse of hope for this understanding. Uh, this is a fishnet CFT limit of gamma twisted n equals four super young mills. I think it's a real chance to understand what this, where this integrability comes from. I will uh, explain it later in, in a little bit more details. Mm. Okay, and uh, now, uh, first of all, the problem of planar spectrum of anomalous dimensions is a great success story, uh, thanks to the efforts of many people over uh, maybe 20 or more years. Uh, and uh, we, this, this, the scheme, uh, this scheme of integrability allows uh, us for calculation of any local and sometimes even non-local operators at any coupling, analytically. Uh, so the ultimate form formalism, uh, which uh, probably hardly can be improved <laughs> anymore, uh, but uh, uh, still something much simpler than the original functional integral is uh, the so-called quantum spectral curve, QSC, uh, which Shota already presented uh, a little bit in his talk. I will probably uh, have, uh, I will, uh, have a, decal, a, a little bit different ang uh, uh, angle of view on the formulation of QSC. And uh, uh, roughly it's a Riemann Hilbert, a nonlinear Riemann Hilbert problem on a few Baxter functions uh, labeled in such a way that they can be placed on so called Hasse diagram and eight dimensional uh, hypercube. So there are 128 such functions. Uh, eight corresponds to the, to the rank of symmetry of PSU 
to go to slash four. And um, they're related by a known algebraic Grassmannian structure. And uh, also we have enough of knowledge about its uh, their analytic structure. Uh, those uh, Baxter functions are direct uh, generalization of uh, standard, uh, this couple of uh, solutions of, uh, of Baxter equation in Heisenberg spin chain. And Shota already mentioned this story. Uh, and in the spin chain, they're simply polynomial encoding all the beta roots um, of, uh, of uh, the Magnon rapidities. Um, uh, but uh, in, of course, in our uh, string sigma, uh, sigma model, this is a much more complicated ob object. The analyticity is much more complicated than just polynomial. Uh, to precise a little bit the labeling of the functions, I go to a simpler uh, four-dimensional hypercube has a diagram which corresponds to G2,2, for example, where you put on one of the vertices the Q empty set function, then the next, uh, the nearest neighbors are Q1234, the single index functions. Then the, uh, the neighbors of one and two on the next level, the neighbor of one and two is Q12, et cetera, et cetera. So up to the full set function Q1234. Um, so you can imagine the same on this eight dimensional uh, Hasse diagram. Uh, now, uh, but uh, these Q functions are not independent, they're uh, algebraically independent. They are related on each phase, on each two dimensional phase. They are related by Pluca relations. For example, the product of Q1 and Q1 to, one to four is the Vronskian of Q12 and Q14. This determinant with characteristic shifts of the spectral parameter by plus minus I, I over two. And uh, then uh, all these relations reduce the number of um, independent Q functions uh, to essentially eight here or four here. Um, uh, and then we have to impose some analytistic conditions, namely for some of these functions, uh, we know the uh, large U asymptotics, which are completely related to the, uh, to the charges of the solution and to the symmetry charges like anomalous dimension delta and conformal spins or three R, R symmetry charges uh, for, the, for another function. Uh, so I give on the examples, of course, but we know uh, all this information. Uh, and also on, on the physical sheet, we have only, uh, only one singularity, only one type of singularities, uh, namely uh, two branch points uh, placed exactly at the points minus G and G, where G is the 12th coupling. So it's the only place where the 12th coupling enters the, uh, the construction. And then uh, we have the most important, we have gluing rules, the monotony, which relate some of these functions uh, in, uh, by uh, complex conjugation. Uh, uh, so that's it. And once you, once you, fix, for example, the integer charges as one, as two, and j's, uh, and you solve, you can solve the problem and find the discrete spectrum, you read off the discrete spectrum of delta from uh, some of these Q functions. That's it. And more or less, uh, this is the construction. Uh, and uh, I think the con it is mathematically quite beautiful and it begs for uh, for the for the uh, analysis by mathematicians and maybe the attempts to find more of such uh, of such uh, quantum spectral curves, uh, maybe and the corresponding theories which are behind them. Uh, of course, the same exists for um, for uh, ABGM, but that's it. We don't have any uh, other um, theories of this kind. This kind of uh, algebraic and analytistic properties describing higher dimensional uh, quantum field theories. Okay, and then um, QSC provides- five, nine minutes. What? Five minutes, okay, great. You, you are at nine minutes, I'm just warning, you are at nine minutes. By the nine way. minutes, okay, three minutes more and I'm done. So uh, a few results obtained uh, from this uh, scheme are reg regular weak coupling expansion, then strong coupling, a few others, but not yet regular expansion. 
Uh, there are other approximations, uh, quite successful approximations like large spins, next to next lowest order for BFK spectrum, uh, quasi exact numerics, easily five digits or more, uh, 550 digits of more of precision for anomalous dimensions. This graph for Konishi was shown already, more or less the same graph by Shota. And I like this spectacular graph, which shows the, uh, the, the twist two uh, operator anomalous dimension as a function of complex spin. And uh, then I, I also stress that um, we, see in quantum spectral curve the ADS CFT correspondence in full glory. Um, okay, and then uh, the last slide, uh, the fishnet CFT limit, which is uh, which corresponds to uh, large complex twist and weak coupling. And the theory, one of the theories of this family has only one coupling, two scatters, two complex scatters with one coupling, sort of chiral coupling. And um, this theory is explicitly integrable uh, in plan of limit uh, in all loops. Uh, <clears throat> the integrability corresponds to the non-compact SU2, comma two spin chain. Uh, QC, QC exists only in the form T of TVA, uh, not of the QQ system. Uh, Feynman graphs for this theory represent the regular lattice. That's why this fishnet structure, that's why it's an integrable statistical mechanical model. But there exists a more complicated dynamical uh, uh, fishnet, uh, uh, integrable fishnet structure for uh, the most general three coupling uh, model of this family, uh, of, uh, of this fishnet family. Uh, family. And uh, you have three lines uh, of uh, three lines corresponding to three families of, um, uh, of bosons and fermions. They, they are both here. And th these lines can move through each other, giving e every time a new graph, if you cross uh, the crossings uh, by other lines. And uh, you can always decode uh, each of these structures in terms of you cover couplings and phi four couplings in an unambiguous way. So this is another sort of dynamical fishnet already more complicated uh, of which whose integrability is still to understand in terms of spin chains. But I think it hints on a, but maybe a regular dynamical lattice structure of planar graphs in the full n equals four super n uh, So this is um, one of the hopes of understanding integrability. Also, the explicit uh, ADS CFT picture was um, constructed uh, for fishnet CFT in terms of so-called fish chain model, uh, a chain of particles on ADS or string bits on, AD, uh, on ADS. And uh, there is also an interesting integrable model for O1, five sigma model for dense fishnet graphs, hinting on another uh, stringy feature of fishnet CFT. And uh, also fish, uh, the uh, fishnet CFT for two scalars exists in any dimension uh, and is also integrable in the planar limit. Here I stop and I pass the baton to Grisha, and later we formulate our open problems and questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Let's thank Volodya while Grisha sets up his uh, share screen. And while Grisha sets up, I remind people that uh, there are also more questions on Slack that uh, Grisha and Volodya collected from uh, the community. So. Do you see my slides? Yeah. Please take over. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we, we believe that planar and co four theory is integrable. And basically this statement based on uh, two observation. One observation comes from weak coupling that we encounter <coughs> spin chains computing a dilatation operator. And strong coupling, we know from ADS-CFT that we're dealing with sigma model, which is integrable. And we believe that ADS-CFT organized in such a way that the capability is preserved all the way when we go from weak to strong coupling. I'm not going to discuss the proof of the statement. I will take another. Uh, take on it. Namely, I will take it for granted the credibility is there. I will try to use the credibility to discuss possibility of computing various coordinates in n equal four, plan equal four theory of arbitrary value of hoof coupling constants. And as you have heard, uh, yesterday there was quite spectacular progress in solving this theory. And here I have selected three different problems. And these problems are ordered in the exponential order of complexity. So the first one is spectral dilatation operator. And as Valodia explained you, 
quantum spectral curve gives you a solution to that particular problem. Second one, on-shell scattering amplitudes. And finally, there is correlation functions. So our goal is just to compute all those coordinates in planar equal four for any valued hoof coupling constant by making use of an equitability. As a natural question to ask, what do we expect to find at the end of the day? And before answering that question, let me take one step backward and let me take as an inspiration what you know about classical quantum integrable models, the field that has been developed over many decades. And what you know from those models is that sometimes the dynamics, which looks very complicated in the regional coordinates, becomes kind of simple if you do appropriate change of the variables, which is <clears throat> canonical transformation in classical models or uh, unitary transformations in quantum models. And one example, which already was mentioned by Shota yesterday, is, for example, separation of variables, planning separation of variables. So the main lesson which you could draw from the gravity continue can cool for, one has to find appropriate coordinates in which complicated dynamics of planar equal four becomes kind of simple. And let me show that this philosophy goes very well if you go from, from uh, scatter candidate to the correlation function. And as, as a warm-up example, let's give you an example of so-called cusp anomalous dimension, which is quantity, which is important in all gauge series because it appears, for example, as controlling for divergence of scatter amplitude. It controls large spin asymptotic anomalous dimension, correlation function, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you know about this coordinate? So if you just start from weak coupling, you turn on machinery of computing Feynman diagrams, and you will find corrections which are shown on this plot right here. And you see that if you start increasing number of loops from three to four, you have unstable result. And actually this dashed line, which indicates the position of stability is exactly the radius of the convergence of this weak coupling expansion, which Shota mentioned yesterday. So now if you go to strong coupling and you invoke a safety correspondence, you have well-defined setup, which allows you to compute cusp anomalous dimensional strong coupling by going through some classical quantization of gaps of klebanov polyakov string. And this way you get some series which turned out to be non barrel sum of them. And finally, you go to integrability and you remember what they just said, you identify right collective coordinates, and those coordinates turned out to describe the dynamics of magnets in the SL2 spin chain. So when you take into account those uh, collective coordinates, you could formulate certain integral equations, and those integral equations allow you to interpolate between weak and strong coupling. So this is exactly the philosophy which I mentioned. You have weak coupling, strong coupling, you have collective coordinates, you formulate dynamics and collective coordinates, and here you set up. So now let's push this philosophy going to the on-shell amplitudes. So as I told you, on-shell amplitudes much more complicated quantity. And therefore, you would expect to have some additional property which is simplify your task. And those properties go to the name of symmetries. So what was found that there's two remarkable properties of the amplitudes in planar electron four. One of them has to do with duality between amplitude and light like Wilson loop. And this duality goes as follows. So you start from scattering amplitudes with K, et cetera, K1, et cetera, Kn on shell momenta of scattered particles. And then you go to dual descriptions, putting some axis in such a way that the segments a stretch between neighboring axes is exactly light like momenta corresponding to scattering particles. So, in this way, you map configuration of initial momenta and configuration of points in Minkowski space times, which form naturally null polygon. And then you define Wilson loop on this particular null polygon. So, the statement goes as in planar n equal four, amplitude computed for configuration of initial momenta coincides with the Wilson loop computed on this red null polygon. And this property becomes quite uh, important because it allows you to continue further and formulate another property, which goes under the name of dual superconformal symmetry, which essentially is a statement that Wilson loop in this dual configuration has conformal symmetry, which translates into dual conformal symmetry of the amplitude. And being combined with conformal symmetry, this gets promoted to Youngian symmetry. Youngian symmetry is <clears throat> synonymous of integrability. So these two symmetries simplify a lot computing amplitude both at weak and strong coupling. A T coupling, this allows you to formulate a regular procedure of computing first integral, the defined class of function, and then bootstrap functions based on analytical properties. And strong coupling, this give you possibility to compute amplitude to the minimal area in a DS5 attached to the polygon now Wilson loop. And then you go to the final coupling. And as I told you, the key point going from final coupling to identify this new collective degrees of freedom, which is simplify your task. Is those new collective degrees of freedom are naturally defined on the Wilson loop configuration, which is shown here. And they describe the fluctuation of surface which are stretched to this polygon contour. 
So those fluctuations could be identified as fluctuations of GKP strings propagating across <coughs> this polygon. And then you could formulate kind of generalized OPE expansion. It's generalized in the sense instead of talking about short distances, you're talking about the limit, one of these kinds cast point becomes kind of flat. And this flattening corresponds to going situation which you have n points to n minus one cast points, which are quite similar to the OPE philosophy in the context of the normal operators. So if you push further this ideology, you could come up with very precise formulation of this now Wilson loop, which according to our duality is exactly the same as <coughs> our amplitude, which factorizes the product of objects which are called pentagon transitions, which could be bootstrapped by integrability. And in context of the OP, those pentagon transitions are analog of the conformal goals. So this, once again, becomes a very well-defined definition of the Wilson loop, which also involves infinite sums and integrals of a number of excitations propagating and their quantum numbers. But as it stands, it's a well-defined object. Unfortunately, it's very hard to compute it for final couplings, but there is some progress in computing in different kinematical limits. So this is a story with amplitudes. Now let's continue just further and then now go to correlation function. As I told you, correlation function is even harder than amplitudes. So how could one proceed here? So we start with the simplest correlation function, which correlation function the half BPS operators. So this is the half BPS operators which build out of the R copies of the scalar field, appropriately symmetrized with respect to R indices. And this operator has some uh, R charge and the left of the operator or its same dimension is exactly the same as R charge. Now we want to compute correlation functions. The first and trivial correlation function is the one which involves four operators. So once again, you turn your Feynman diagram technology, and you could show that those correlation functions could be bootstrapped quite efficiently to first few order of perturbative expansion using superconformal symmetry plus additional OP constraints. So then it goes to strong coupling, and strong coupling at GSCFT allows you to map the problem into the problem of computing static amplitude on GF <coughs> space. And there was recently progress in computing some loops on gravity sides and swing sides. And then finally, you come to the last step, and exactly the same as before, we have now to define those new degrees of freedom. And these new degrees of freedom appear in the framework which calls under the name of hexanalization approach, which already appeared earlier this morning. And the idea of this approach is just to look for the <coughs> all Feynman diagrams you could consider computing those correlation functions as forming some surface in the hoofed sense. And then you look for the surface and you start to think about the surface as a whole sheet of some effective integral to dimensional theory. So then what you do, you chop it into different uh, patches. In total, there are six patches, oh, excuse me, there is four patches, patches for point correlation function with some holes representing operators. And then what you do, you resolve each patch by putting some full sum of the states. And those states describe the fluctuation at the top of the surface. So in this way, this correlation function could be written as this new effective coordinates into the product of four hexagon form factors and hexagon because it comes from the shape of these patches. Each of these form factor could be again bootstrap for any value of the coupling constant. And in this way you get the representation for full point correlation functions, which again is infinite sum of the integrals of those fluctuations which are propagated at the top of each hexagon and the cross hexagon. And those else correspond to the R charge which are transferred from one hexagon to another one. So similar to the amplitude story, this is a well-defined representation, but it's very difficult to use it because of technical difficulties of computing. There is different limit you could consider, and one of the limits correspond to the situation where each of these operators sitting in each of this hole has infinitely large R charge. In this situation, this full point correlation function in this effective dimensional field theory factorizes in the product of two point function. Each of these two point function becomes effectively octagon. So this is exactly the octagon which we appeared uh, yesterday in the talk of uh, Frank Caronada. And this octagon becomes a very nice object because first of all, we could obtain very concise representation in terms of Fred Gold determinants. And secondly, applying the techniques for those Fred Gold determinants, you could get quite a number of analytical results. So this becomes the end of the story. So I try to show you that if you knew from the very beginning what the collective coordinates and what effective dynamics of those coordinates, there's quite a regular way how you could go from the first principle definition of the object to some representation which make use of the integrability. So with this, I will finish and I will give word to our order because now we switch to the open questions. You are though out of time. So you might consider to just flashing them or being super, super brief because yeah, otherwise we'll run out of time for the free discussion. 
I think I mostly already pronounced this kind of problems. Uh, uh, I think it's good just to flash and then. Well, let, let, let's go then to the final slide. So let, let's, let's be then, then brief. So basically, if you're talking about questions, first of all, questions, uh, as we already mentioned, you could find file with all questions on the Slack. But basically, there is five class of questions which one might ask. So the first one, the one which addressed by Valodia, what's the origin of the credibility? Second, given the information which we provided you, do you believe that we solved the theory? Third question, is it possible to think about an equal for theory, some kind of deformed version of the fishnet theory? Fourth question, we didn't discuss plan, non planar correction yet. So there's quite a critical number of evidences coming both from correlation functions and amplitudes that the gradability actually holds in kind of not, not trivial way beyond planar limits. And finally, the last question, which is most interesting to my mind, if we will solve equal for theory, what did we learn about QCD? And there's quite a number of lessons to learn. So I, I think at that moment I stop and uh, probably now time to look for yep. questions. Thank you very much. Let's thank uh, Volade and Grisha for a very nice discussion, for a nice, very nice introduction. And uh, as I said, we move to the informal part and uh, we can go a bit into the coffee break. That's totally fine. So- Can I stop sharing the screen? Pedro, I stop sharing the screen. Uh, yeah, why not? Yes, you can stop sharing, yeah. People are encouraged to check the questions, especially on Slack where there are many. Uh, so, uh, she, you had a, some questions in the chat. Uh, uh, I, I want to ask a different uh, question uh, about the, the last point that was raised in the open questions. Uh, I guess what 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 is uh, some what are some uh, viable plausible proposals about observability in non-conformal planar uh, gauge theories? Uh, Could you repeat the last part of the question? I didn't hear. Uh, uh, okay, so, so it's about the last question that was in the last uh, slide. Uh, what, what are some plausible proposals about the meaning of integrability for uh, non-conformal planar theories, such as the uh, large and uh, pure Yamios? Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, sorry, no, before, before, before you answer, Grisha, let me remind people something I forgot, sorry. Uh, but that uh, turning on your camera for this informal part is very nice, if you can, if your internet allows, of course. Yeah. Oh, so probably sorry, go on, please, Grisha. Okay, what, what I propose, I, I couldn't, uh, let me now uh, re return to my slides, just to show you the slides which I skipped. Uh, I, yeah, this one, do, do, do you see my slide? Hello? Uh, yeah, we can stop slide, yeah, yeah. yeah we can so, uh, kind of back to the question. So about the credibility in uh, non-conformal, non-supersymmetric theory. So, so those are different questions about non-supersymmetric and non-conformal. But if you're talking about QCD, so this is the worst scenario in the sense that you're breaking everything possible, right? You have broken conformal symmetry, broken supersymmetry. So what you know, and these are experimental uh, results, that uh, uh, if you're thinking about uh, places where the credibility could appear in QCD, then it appears exactly the same places where you see it in equal four. Namely, you go to the rotation operator. So even though conformal symmetry in QCD is broken, you know how to control. You have column semantic equation, and you could define the rotation operator in the column semantic equation. Then you would find that, in general, the rotation operator in QCD is broken, but there is some sector, special sectors, in which it's integrable up to two loops. And let me remind you that starting from two loop, you're already sensitive to conformal symmetry breaking. So, which means that this integrability I'm talking about, it's, it knows about breaking conformal symmetry, still there is integrability. And second example is uh, uh, amplitude, scattering amplitude in the regular limit. So if you're taking scattering amplitude, uh, for example, two to, glue, two to two gluon scattering in QCD and equal for theory, you will see it's a completely different. But if you go to the regular limit, which is limit when uh, you fixed uh, momentum transfer T fixed and S goes to infinity, you will see that this four gluon amplitude in QCD looks remarkably similar to an equal four result. So in that sense, what I'm saying is that uh, there is these facts which come from the specific calculation of certain coordinates in QCD, but we don't understand where they come from. And if you believe that explanation in equal four about the gravity comes from a DSFT, then you should naturally conclude that if similar phenomenon happens in QCD, you should go through some dual stingy description. 
And given the fact that the gravity depends on the radial limit, is exactly the limit when you're expecting QCD described by some string theory. One may speculate that it's some kind of effective QCD string we should know about the gravity. Sorry, can right. I do that? Hey, may I add, add something? Uh, I wanted to also to notice that uh, actually uh, Lipatov's Lagrangian for rigidized gluons, uh, which is uh, at the heart of uh, uh, of this integrability in QCD is um, in the same integrability class as fishnet, uh, at, uh, a two-dimensional fishnet theory, which uh, I presented. They have the same set of integrals of motion, so it's all another interesting link. Uh, that's it. Can you let me ask a question about that, Volodya? Is this Lipatov story seen in experiments? Uh, actually, some people said that it will be never seen, but recently I heard that something was seen. And maybe there are some there are some people in the audience who heard more about it. But I heard that in some experiment uh, it was seen. Uh, I will comment. I will comment. Grisha, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there, there are some things which you have to take into account. Namely, uh, talking about technical for theory, talking about uh, perturbative theory, meaning that there is no genuine non perturbative effects aside from dreams and quantum. QCD is a completely different theory in the infrared, right? So now the question is if you're talking about, to the, if you go to the experiment and you try to do some comparison between what the computer perturbative expansion and experiment, you should always be careful about what you're comparing. Namely, have to be sure that the number you want to compare with have the same origin. So now, what people measure in the experiment, for example, they measure total cross section. And uh, recently, <clears throat> there was a lot of data coming from LHC, for example, for proton-proton cross-section. And uh, people use previous data from Tevatron, proton anti proton to look for the difference between proton-proton and proton anti proton cross-section. And the reason why the difference is important because it gives you access to so-called odor. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, what, what happens if you, go, if you go, go to the proton-proton cross-section and you plot it as a function of total energy, you'll see that it grows. And the uh, way how it grows, it grows like power line with the exponent being one, roughly speaking, 1.08, which normally called soft Pomeron. Now, if you go to uh, Lipatov approach, uh, more precisely, it's bf approach. The bf approach is some certain class of fishnet di diagrams, and they give you a number, which, uh, depending uh, on different estimates, is 1.2. So now the question is, if you compare a number 1.2 and 1.08, they look similar. But the main problem is that one number is, comes from the perturbative physics, physics deeply in the infrared. Another comes from the perturbative. So therefore, even though this number looks quite similar, they have a completely different physics behind them. And talking to, about other one, for the other one story even more interesting because for, for the other one, uh, <clears throat> the gravity give you predictions that the cross-section should be constant. It should not depend on the energy. And uh, 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 what I mean by this, according with the Bethkel approach, and the quite surprisingly, experimentalists found more or the same. So they found the difference between proton, 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 and proton, roughly speaking, flat in energy. So once again, you have two numbers which you take with grain, grain of salt because uh, there's different, you're comparing two quantities which come from different types of physics, infrared versus infrared, ultraviolet. So, the fact that they agree is nice, but uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say that this is a proof that the perturbative approach successfully described the perturbative physics. I'm not sure if Gabriele Veneziano wants to add something. If he, he raised uh, his hand at this point, I don't know if he was waving or not because you, you don't have your camera on. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I had a little comment on, on this point. I wasn't waving. Uh, yes. uh, no, I, I, what I, I don't, uh, I can't understand is how. Uh, the regular limit can be integrable in pure young mills because that would amount to really solving the confinement problem altogether. I can understand that you can approach perhaps the so-called hard pomeron, but the soft pomeron, I don't think it, you, you can expect it to, to be calculable by an integrable theory. Do you agree? Uh, Probably I, I expressed myself in the wrong way. I completely agree with what you were saying. And basically, this was my uh, punchline. I was saying that if you're thinking about QCD being n equal 4 plus something, I was saying n equal 4 is completely different exactly for that reason, that it's trivial as infrared. 
Yeah. So it's actually non trivial infrared. And Since I, you were talking about the red limit, the red limit is soft physics. Exactly. And but so it has some tail. Yeah. <laughs> if you think about the rigid trajectory, there's always tail of rigid trajectory, which goes to negative T, where you expect it to find some perturbative contamination with pull this way. Okay. So I, I, I would be very uh, pessimistic about possibility of pushing this perturbative rigid trajectory towards smaller values of T, not to say positive value of T. But for negative, large values of negative T, you might say that you may stay still in perturbative regime and there you could draw perturbative diagrams and try to describe behavior. Is there, can I also ask, is there in Lipatov's approach the concept of uh, planarity or not? Um, it, it's a very interesting question. What happens that if you don't impose planarity constraints, so you, you, you mm -hmm. imagine you sum all diagrams exactly. Mm -hmm. Then if you go to high energy limit, the so-called leading logarithmic approximation, you will find that non-planar diagram don't produce leading contribution. So non-planar okay. diagram suppressed in the original limit, but okay. starting from two loop, starting beyond collinear quarter, when you're looking for, about corrections to, uh, so you're looking for the intercept, you're looking correction, which goes as a second power coupling cost. And there, non-planar corrections contribute. And moreover, uh, what you could show, in QCD, those corrections have a tendency to be unstable in the sense they become sensitive to the infrared physics in QCD. Thank you. Uh, let's maybe move to Costas. Uh, uh, Leonardo waved, so maybe it's, this is still related yes, to this. I had, yes, I had a related question. So we learned about the effective action on long strings. And presumably from lattice data, we can match the leading uh, W4 correction that we learned about. And then there should be a simple question whether that action is integrable or not. I perfectly agree. Moreover, uh, this uh, uh, what, is the answer known? I, not, not, not that I know. If somebody could comment on this, I don't know. That. Thank you. No, but the probably I see Victor probably should give should know the answer about two dimensional QCD. Well, I, I think that this is related to what. Sergey talked about uh, in, in the discussion that followed Sergey's talk. Yeah, we have some conjecture. I mean, the, the action data suggests that the uh, flux tube is close to some integrable theory. So we know that it's not exactly integrable, of course. And then we have some conjectures that in the UV limit where you can possibly connect with perturbative QCD, integrability gets restored, but in some subtle way we don't have an you know an, an, an exact formulation but the idea that there are some hard processes on the string world sheet that are integrable but you know it we know for sure it is not exactly integrable yeah that that we know for sure both in 3d young mills and in 4d young mills from lattice simulations you can see the level splitting that uh, prohibits integrability in 4d we know it's theoretically in 3d we know it's experimental Thank you. Uh, Costas? Okay, I have a different question. Uh, it's, it's about anomalous dimensions. Um, do we know the anomalous dimensions of multi-trace operators for any value of lambda? Oh, yeah. Um, once again, uh, the- If we know the dimensions of multi-trace operators. Uh, the multi-trace operators. Uh, this is, I, I think, a subleading order already. Uh, I mean, uh, it seems that in the large and limit, uh, we only can say something about about local single trace operators. Single so trace would would mean for me already a sort of a limit of uh, of three point function. Yes, when you put two of them together, so. Uh, I'm not sure. By, let's say if you took a two-point function of two multi-trace operators, mm -hmm. yeah, you can read off the dimension as a function of lambda to lead the order in the larger limit. That's if true, but uh, I don't think uh, qu uh, quantum spectral uh, curve formalism uh, uh, can be used directly for such calculation. At least I don't know. Uh, any of such suggestions? Why, if we're just focusing now on single trace operators, why maybe there is a comment? 
some budget. There is what? No, I mean, I, I thought I heard somebody talking, but um, a, a different question. So if, if we're just focusing now on civil trace operators, do we know things like uh, what is the number of nearly marginal operators as a function of lambda and of generic properties and properties of the spectrum um, of this type? Uh, of course, if, if you're staying in the planar limit, once again, uh, there's two different questions. If you're staying in the planar limit, those double trace operators kind of trivial. Everything factorizes in the product of the correlation function when you single trace. That sounds yes. But for example, if you couple the double trace with single trace, uh, then it, it looks, it smells like a three point, three point yeah, function. Yeah. Then you would need to consider higher point functions. You need to solve first the high point function. So then, of course, uh, you would be able to read them off in, in lim as, as a limit, coincident limits or a factorizable limits of those. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I agree. Me, the question is whether already we have the, the technology to, to have this answer without doing this process. No, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, who knows? Maybe you, the QSC can be generalized in this way. At least it seems simpler than just three point function, yes. Let me make a small comment that uh, one thing that we don't know yet how to tame completely are extremal processes from integrability where, uh, so for example, three point functions, which are extremal, which are ones where these double trace operators are most important are very, very tricky because they're very similar to deal. It's typically easier to deal with things that are not extremal. One thing that is possible to do, but hard to do in practice is to do, to compute a four point function of sim single trace operators at genus order at non-planar and so on. And then from the OPE, you could read off the dimensions of double trace. But in practice, it's, 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 it's not yet doable because of the complications that Grisha explained, that there are too many sums and integrals to do at this stage. There, there's, one except, there's one exception. So if you remember the story of octagon from a Frank or another. So if you think about four-point correlation functions that are added a period of this R, large R charge, so four-point functions, then you take OPE, as you said, across the diagonal. So you have four operators which sitting at the corner of the rectangle, so that uh, they talk uh, each operator because of the, cho of the choice of the parallelization talks only to its neighbors. And then you could do you could take OP across the diagonal. These two operators don't talk to each other, and therefore in the OP there will be no single edge associated with the short distance between them. From this OP, you do have access to the double trace operator with a large R charge. And then if you look in the papers on the octagon, you will see there is a explicit expression, and uh, they're, they're basically you could find uh, those anomalous dimensions for these particular operators uh, for any value of the coupling constant. The other question, the kind of how many nearly marginal operators you have as a function of lambda, is this something? It's, it's, no. it's about single trace or double trace operators? Sing, single trace. Yeah. It's a question about uh, solution. Let's say it's a question like <clears throat> a story of two B times that. So it's just draw the analogy. So at, at one loop level, you know the normal dimension described by eigenstates of the Heisenberg spin chain. So more or less you're asking the question, uh, you specify quantum numbers of the operator, you're asking how many states you could get a solution to those to be, but it would be to that equation. I think th these are well-defined questions. I don't know the answer, maybe Logan knows. Not really, not really. More questions? Uh, there is a question, Marcos Spradlin, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the chat question? Or uh, if you just write no in the chat, maybe I can. Uh... Is there is an analog of the Lundau equation of strong coupling? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. What is the question? Is, is there is an analog? If Mark would repeat, say himself. So. No, I mean, he might be in a place with too much noise. So he was asking if uh, there are analogous equations like the Landau equations that strong coupling. So these are equations that govern the singularities of amplitudes. So do they also, do we see them at strong coupling? I think it's- The answer is yes. And if Sasha Zhebayedov is there, he'll better qualify to answer the question. It's about bulk singularity. So if you're thinking about computing for the four-point correlation function of the simplest operators, Similar to um, yes. Uh, yes. So if we have uh, if we have correlation functions, 
Then uh, if we're talking about perturbation theory for correlation functions in the bulk, it is again a product of uh, propagators integrated over the vertices. And then one can derive one down questions in exactly the same uh, way. So that's just what we discussed with uh, David and Juan. Um, now, my understanding is that what Marcus is asking is probably uh, slightly different, which is that if we have a so in in the, in the bulk perturbation theory is the answer I would say yes, but if we are talking about finite lambda, and uh, if the question is what are the singularities at finite lambda and integrability, okay, yes, so then then um, I don't know, but maybe someone else knows. Yeah, I can, I can just make a comment that uh, I mean. Some people in integrability are trying to compute more than four point functions, and it looks a little bit silly. Why more than four? Precisely because of that. One of, this is one of the main reasons, because we want eventually to go to six points and understand this resolution of this bulk singularity and how it works. But, sorry, I, I think he, he's asking about the uh, scattering amplitudes, glue on scattering amplitudes. Ah, not, not uh, those things. Yeah, okay, that's precisely that. the point he was making. Ah, sorry, sorry, I missed that one. Okay, sorry. sorry. And I guess you should be able to answer, no? Uh, no, because clearly I was I was looking for waving hands, and then I re I heard half the question. So maybe if you if you uh, the DAO, I was uh, if you summarize the question again, and then maybe but, uh, but let, let's pass to Igor so that I can breathe again. Uh, yeah, thanks for the discussion. Uh, I guess uh, QCD we know is hard. It's unlikely to be exactly integrable just from numerical data from the lattice. And uh, n equal four super n mills has these wonderful properties, but there are lots of theories in between. So one question could be, is there some other really nice super, some theory with reduced supersymmetry, which happens to be exactly planar integrable? I mean, just to add to the pool of questions. I think Eli has something to add about this. Can you add Eli? Yeah, we put out a paper a few days ago uh, where mm -hmm. we look at n equal to two super conformal theories, and we find signs of integrability, but it's a, of elliptic type, so it's much more complicated than what we know from n equal to four. And of course, what we did is one loop, so there is really a lot to. It's really just the beginning. But uh, maybe one thing which I uh, uh, didn't have to say about that there is some property which we observed uh, for quite a number of different quantities, which I already, already, mm -hmm. already mentioned about this maximum transcendentality weight property. And uh, this property has status experimental observation, namely, you take certain coordinates and equal for theory, and then you go to other series which have less supersymmetry. And then what you will see is that for a special class of quantities, not general statement, but special class of quantities, you will see the final result looks like you take an equal for result and you add something which looks much simpler. So this property, we don't understand neither where it comes from from equal four, but it's kind of a mental fact. And equal four, it's property there. And it's not clear why this property get deformed if you go to see this less supersymmetry. Well, let's let's have shot a shot if waving. He might have something. To no, no, no. I, I just had a, like a follow up question to Ellie. So, so you are so you found some nice structure, but it doesn't seem to fit in the ordinary framework of integrability because if you want to construct a state like a two magnon state, then there is some like a process in which the momentum is not conserved, right? If I understand correctly. And so so this is correct, but this is because we wrote, at least uh, for now, we wrote everything naively we use, using momenta. Uh, the correct way to do this is to start using theta functions because the model is really elliptic. And there is not clear what will happen to all of these momenta. So this is an exercise to be understood, basically. I hope I that all of these extra shadows of the momenta will all fit in the theta function, but this is some serious work to, to understand. Uh, I see. And there is like a no, no known, like a useful method to construct like a higher conserved charges and 
like algebraically construct the states. No, there is algebraic Bethesians for elliptic models, for dynamical elliptic models. But um, I mean, I can say some things. I don't know how long I should go on for. So the, 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 the trick is you need to understand what is the corresponding vertex model. So for n equal to two theories, now we say that there is a 15 vertex model. And uh, first of all, you need to properly construct this model. Maybe this model has a star triangle relationship. So this is where you start from. This is the equivalent of uh, the Young-Baxter equation. And then you need to, to translate this to Felder type dynamical uh, Young-Baxter equations. This is the framework. And do you think you can go to the Veneziano limit? So the Venetiano limit, so in this paper, we studied mostly this Z2 orbifold of n equal to 4. In order to study super QCD, you just take one of the coupling constants and you send it to zero. So, of course, yes, yes. I think Valadi has a related comment. Yeah, uh, I wanted to say that to me, uh, to search for uh, new Lagrangians, which might be integrable, is a very, uh, is, is a very hard task. But uh, once I remember... Um, Sergio Ferrara asked me on one of my talks, uh, uh, can you use this quantum spectral uh, curve um, construction like this uh, hypercube uh, uh, with Q functions with certain conditions on them? Uh, can you use it to, for the search of new uh, integrable theories? So you start from the beginning of the conform of integrable from an integrable structure. Uh, supersymmetry is a very nice and simple thing. It's said like a rotation of this cube on a certain angle. Um, so it might be a search tool for new such theories. That's what I wanted to propose. Mm -hmm. Integrable theories. Or at least we might understand why only those two are integrable, like ABGM and N equals four is the scheme is so tight that it admits nothing else. I have um, a kind of a silly question for Volodya. Volodya, what, how do you imagine the four point function of four, four 20 prime operators looking like in the final solution? What, uh, these operators are trivial, they are vacuum, right? There's nothing, what will it be? Some integral over some Q functions, some multiple integrals, some integral equations, some functional equation. How do you think the four-point function of 420 prime operators will look like? Uh, the only idea which inspires me here uh, for the answer is that I would think of the, the corresponding group structure, namely to look for the analogy with klebsch gordan coefficients, uh, you know, integrals of characters, etc. I, I think this gives the analogy, like from the matrix models, what are these four-point function, multi-point functions. And uh, of course, Q functions are a new object for uh, with respect to simple group theory. But still, these integrals of Q functions remind me the integrals of characters. And transfer matrices are the, the generalizations of characters in, um, in integrable theories. So I would search in this direction. Uh, for the, <clears throat> I mean, of course, the, the final answer for, uh, for correlators should be uh, using the QSC data you formulated as some integrals. But I think the, anal the analogy sh should be of this kind, klebsch gordan coefficients quantized in some way. Thank you. I suggest we thank Volodya and Grisha for the, this beautiful discussion. But uh, as usual, we have time before the next talk, so we can continue a bit more informally. Let me confirm at what time is the next talk. <laughs>